We had a uh, we had a great time visiting my son and a daughter-in-law in San Francisco last weekend. They live out there, and it's good to be back for one of the major celebrations of our year, uh, the night of thanks this Wednesday night. Uh, you don't want to miss this, as Wes was telling you. I mean, this is one of our favorite things around here, uh, and you want to get here early to get a good seat. It's that, it's that big a deal. Uh, I thought in light of the upcoming holiday and all we've been through in this election cycle, we would uh, spend this weekend talking about what this holiday is about, about being thankful. Gratitude is a huge deal with God. Uh, you see it all through the pages of Scripture in places like 1 Thessalonians 5.18 where the Apostle Paul even makes it a command. He says, thank God in everything. No, no matter what the circumstances may be, be thankful and give thanks for this is the will of God for you who are in Christ Jesus. Now read a verse like that. And I think, well, obviously, I mean, I should always be thanking God. But when I'm sick or in a lousy mood or bad situation and things are going down, you know, that I'm not happy about, that's not, sure not where I tend to go. Uh, my automatic reflex is to launch into a string of, you know, this isn't fair, and no, this isn't right, and I don't deserve this, and why is this happening to me, and Lord, do something now, and grumble, grumble, grumble. And it's why when I read a story like the one I'm going to tell you, you know, it just, <laughs> it's sort of a, a wake up, you know, it's like, how is this even possible? A young soldier by the name of Private Smith was spending his third Thanksgiving away from home in the chaos of Baghdad. True story and name. Uh, his first Thanksgiving abroad was in Seoul, uh, South Korea. Uh, that one began with latrine duty and ended with a cold turkey sandwich and eight hours of guard duty. Thanks, Uncle Sam. Year two. He was in North Africa. This time, uh, the mess hall was serving a hot three-course turkey dinner when a sudden stand sandstorm blew in, spoiled all the food, leaving the soldiers to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Bummer. So now it's year three. Thanksgiving's right around the corner. Smith is in his room or in his tent, actually, cleaning his rifle, grumbling, you know, this year better be different. And he's telling one of his buddies about how it was back home in Mississippi where his mom would always prepare this big feast, and afterwards his dad would read the story of the first Thanksgiving, and then his mom would cuddle up close to him and read verses from the Bible on thankfulness, and the kid said, what do I have to be thankful for now? Nothing. And suddenly... His world exploded. Two weeks later, he heard a little voice saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. But he couldn't see anyone and thought, Wait, wait a minute, where am I? And the voice began yelling, Come out. He's coming out of a coma. His eyes flew open. A doctor appeared, asked you know, how he felt, if he could remember anything. Smith whispered his name, rank, and serial number. The doctor laughed and said, Nurse, you have just witnessed a miracle. Take good care of him. He walked away. The private asked her why she had quoted that particular Bible verse, and she said, Because today's Thanksgiving, and after what you've been through, surely you of all people would be thankful. When he asked what he'd been through, she said, You've been in a coma for two weeks. Uh, you were seriously injured. The, the bomb, you know, hit your tent. We weren't sure you'd even make it. You saved your friend's life by covering his body with your own. You're a hero. You'll, you'll be receiving a purple heart for your bravery and sacrifice. And, and by the way, you lost a leg in that explosion. And he reached down to where his leg used to be. And after a few moments, he said, you know, from, for some time now, it, it's been difficult very difficult to be thankful on Thanksgiving and other, other days as well. I guess I was trying to be glad for the wrong things, things that I thought were important but really aren't, at least not in the grand scheme of things. I lost my leg, but I gained something even more precious, my life, and I'm so thankful my buddy's alive too. I'm, I'm thankful and glad for what I have. This is the best Thanksgiving ever. You know, it's that little shift, you know, in our under, I mean, in our thinking, it's, it's like, oh, yeah. 
My goodness, we take a lot for granted. We are so myopic when it comes to all the wonderful things in our lives we have to be thankful for. We get hung up on the, in the here and now, and we never have all the information. You know, we evaluate everything on the basis of our little platform of what looks right and good in the moment. But the Bible gives us the big picture. This is the big perspective and assurance that we have. Uh, in Romans 8.28, Paul is talking to us. And I want you to read this with me right off the screen. Here's what we know. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. That's why we can be thankful in everything. I'm just reminding myself that God is always good. He is always working things together for my good, period. Even when I can't see it, even when I don't understand it, even when it feels like the opposite is happening, God is going to bring good out of this. Job 12.10 says, the life of every living thing is in his hand, the breath of every human being. I remind myself, God's always in control. I, you know, he, he has not lost touch with things. He is not wringing his hands. He is in control. I quote David in Psalm 25.1, Lord, I put my life in your hands. I trust in you. My God, and I will not be disappointed. When I pray those words, it begins to open my eyes to the grace that he's got just surrounding me. I love Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God's always blessing me even when I can't see it. And it, it all comes into focus when I begin to thank him for it. Our fa founding fathers gave us this tremendous gift that we're going to look at Wednesday night. In fact, I, studying this out this week, I learned some things I didn't know. You, this is going to be fun to talk about Wednesday night. And thanks to Abraham Lincoln, this week we, uh, our whole country has a day that we commemorate to specifically thank God for his blessing. I think I told you about the Sunday school teacher who thought she'd have some fun with her preschoolers, you know, on this, she said, now Thanksgiving is this week, children, which is, you know, the day we think about all the stuff we have and how we want to have more stuff than everybody else and how we don't care, you know, about anybody but ourselves and all the little kids go in, no, no, my little guy yelled out, that's not Thanksgiving, that's Christmas. <laughs> and there you have it. That's me. You know, I get caught in this black hole of thinking about all the stuff I don't have, overlooking all the stuff I do have, and I get help from hundreds of emails and advertisements and catalogs showing me all the latest gadgets and cool clothes that have just come out, and yes, I know there is a, a spam filter on my email that I could stick all that in, but I, I need to see what I'm missing. You know what I mean, right? And then they send me the Sharper Image catalog this week. And, of course, I need a lot of things out of that. I need one of those light drones, you know, that just, I don't know what I'd do with it, but it just goes up in the sky, you know, and I'm thinking, I need that. It's ridiculous. And I find myself dwelling on, you know, other people have more than I do. You know, life isn't fair. It just suffocates all the joy right out of me. I don't want to face that my real problem is ingratitude. You know, it's my refusal to focus on what I have and be grateful for it. And according to Scripture, this is the very thing that bursts in way back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve bought the lie that God was holding back the good stuff. If you, if you go at it, that's, that's the deal. That by eating the forbidden fruit, they could gain this special knowledge that would make them like God. When truth was they were already like God. They were created in his image. Here's the, here's the bitter root of sin. It's the pride of refusing to give credit where credit is due. Romans 12, 121, uh, Paul identifies it here. He says, everything that's wrong with us starts with this fact. People knew God intuitively looking at creation. They knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. And that's a perfect description of ingratitude. 
It's the ultimate dismissal of God and all that's good because he is all that's good. This says even uh, says when, when we refuse to, to thank him, we darken our own minds. We deceive ourselves. We get all twisted up inside, uh, believing the devil's lie that God isn't really that good, you know. He's holding back something from you. You know, he's, good, he's giving things to others, but you're not getting all, all the good stuff. Paul's the same guy who said in Romans 8.32, he says, look, guys, just think this through. Logic alone says, since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? I mean, why would God start holding out on us now that we're his? He purchased us. He redeemed us. He bought us. Why would he, why would he possibly start holding out on us now? And to give him thanks is to recognize that. That all I am, all I have comes from his loving hand. Acts 17, 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. God, God wants us to own this. We didn't, he didn't just create us. He, we're the object of his affection. We're his delight. We're his pride and joy. He loves interacting with us. He's always thinking about us, always blessing us with new mercy. Now, I think all of us know what it feels like to do something really kind or really sacrificial for somebody and not get thanked. But uh, maybe this next story will kind of take that to a different level. This, this happened one stormy night on Lake Michigan in 1860. A thousand-ton sidewheeler was returning to Milwaukee from a political rally in Chicago for uh, the presidential candidate, Stephen Douglas, and it was rammed by another boat and sank just a mile offshore in Winnetka, Illinois. Of the 393 people aboard, 279 people drowned. That was a big, huge disaster. Edward Spencer, a 26-year-old theology student, saw what was happening, plunged into the lake and swam to the drowning people that he could get to. He grew up on his father's ferry, so swimming in the Mississippi was his favorite pastime. He reached one, towed her back to shore, fighting a vicious undertow for five minutes, and went after another. Six hours later, he had brought in 17 survivors. But the strain of the ordeal took such a toll on his body, he never really recovered. He, he wasn't able to stay in school, spent most of the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And it was one of those, you know, just senseless tragedies that happen because we live in a fallen world. On his 80th birthday, he was asked his most vivid memory of that dreadful day. And you know what he said? Not one of those 17 people returned to thank me. 54 years, and not one came back to express gratitude. He had literally saved 17 lives and didn't get a single word of thanks. And that shocks us, but should it? I mean, we tend to do the same thing with God people who serve us and sacrifice for us. I'm telling you, you know, God is really turning up the heat on me in this. I, I, I am getting promptings from the Holy Spirit that I think I've blocked out for most of my life because uh, sometimes I'm turning TV off earlier at night and, you know, getting up and spending time with the Lord. And I'm getting these promptings, you know, why don't you send an email? Why don't you text that person? Express some appreciation for, you know, what they've done, how they stood alongside you and helped you. And I know, a, you know, small a gesture this seems, it almost seems like, well, duh, I mean, do you really need to be talking about this? But Jesus lets us know this stuff really, really matters. In Luke 17, uh, Jesus is talking, uh, it actually heals here 10 lepers who are crying out for mercy. And only one of these guys returns to say thanks. And his response to this is so revealing. He says, wait, wait, wait a minute. There were 10 men who were healed. Where are the other nine? So he noticed. <laughs> Why is this man the only one who came back to give thanks to God? And Jesus said to him, arise and go. Your faith has made you whole. Now, th to me, this is like, Whoa, pay attention to this. This is God being totally transparent here. Where are the others? He's wounded by this. I mean, this, this hurts. He expected some thanks. And look at what they missed out on. This guy walked away healed and whole. Now, 
I don't know fully what that means. It may mean he got his missing fingers back or his missing toes. They went away cleansed of their leprosy, but this guy goes away whole. Gratefulness is a big deal to God. Just like the 17 pull from Lake Michigan, these 10 guys got something far more valuable than anything money could buy. They got their lives back. And only one man did the simplest thing we humans can, can do. He came back to say thanks. And we think, well, well, yeah, I would have done that. Really? I'll be honest. You know, I, I think I'm doing way better at this than I am. I'm a terrible self-observer. Do you ever have, when, those of you who have teenagers, oh, man, my kids used to do me in. And usually it was like at the stoplight right in front of the church. They'd say, Dad, do you want me to be real honest with you? I, I knew I was in for it. You know, I was going to get a lecture on how badly I was doing what I was preaching. But this is one I think we're all really bad at. I'm really bad at it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let's say it's been raining all week. Your world's a dark, depressing place, and you're not feeling good. You think you might have the Zika virus. You know, it's just... <laughs> your doctor runs a bunch of tests and sends you out for an MRI, and you wait forever, and finally he wants you back in his office, and he walks in with a grim face and says, you've got a very aggressive cancer, and there's no treatment for it. You have only a few months to live. You leave his office in a daze. I mean, you walk right out into a downpour and don't even notice. You just got a death sentence. You're dying. That changes everything. Well, here's a reality check. Every one of us sitting here today is under a death sentence. I mean, we're all going to die. The death rate is hovering at 100% <laughs> right now. And the fact that we're not dead is a gift from our Creator. Amen. This moment is our gift. This moment is our gift. You say, well, I'm young. We had a young man on our staff. It broke our hearts. It wrecked us when Colin was killed in a car crash. And this moment is a gift to us. I mean, if we would learn to celebrate the gift of this moment, and be grateful for it, man, that would change our whole perspective. In fact, the Apostle Paul links that with experiencing the supernatural peace of God. Now, I didn't put all this together until you start reading this verse in context. Look at Philippians 4.4. 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness, your graciousness, be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He's coming. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with what? Thanksgiving, there it is. Let your request be made known to God, and here's what will happen if you do that. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's the Apostle Paul telling us clearly that prayer with thanksgiving are the keys to experiencing the peace that passes all human understanding. So what's wrong with us? Why is it so easy to take stuff for granted till it's taken away from us? Why do we do this? You know, why are we not more grateful? Why do we not stop and thank God? It's this fallenness in our human nature. Because I mean, if we were even half as fervent about thanking God for his goodness as we are asking for his help, I mean, we'd be totally different people. And we'd sure experience a lot less anxiety. Ingratitude seriously messes with us. It sours our lives. It makes us miserable. There's just a slew of studies over the last decade to prove this, and they all show that the simple act of thanksgiving is therapeutic. Scientist uh, Robert Emmons says that people who view life as a gift and consciously pursue an attitude of gratitude experience multiple advantages that can be scientifically measured and proven. He studied it for 16 years. He says, when people are grateful and thankful and appreciative in their daily lives, they feel less depressed and stressed, more loving, forgiving, joyful, enthusiastic. People around them say they're more helpful, outgoing, optimistic, and trustworthy. I could use about every one of those things, you know, a whole lot more. Just, he says, just 
Keeping a gratitude journal, this is what he suggests, keeping a gratitude journal for three weeks will result in better sleep, more energy, and well-defined abs. <laughs> Just wanted to see if you're still awake, all right? Uh, didn't, didn't really say the last one. All right, let's do that one in. All right, the evidence is clear. Number one, gratitude produces joy. But number two, it takes effort. I mean, this is not going to come easy. I mean, learning how to notice stuff and express gratitude for it, I mean, it's, it's difficult, especially in the beginning, because it's a discipline. See, I never thought of it that way. I mean, I, it, this is really helping me, you know, studying this. It, it is a discipline. It is a discipline to make myself stop and say, thank you, Lord. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm studying this all week. I'm preaching it this weekend. This morning, I get up, and I'm thinking, I'm, not, I'm still not doing it, am I? I'm still not doing this. I am not doing I'm going to do this, God. So, you know, deliberately, I go through this laundry list of all the things I have to be grateful for, and it changed my whole disposition in worship. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to have to just see this like fasting, you know? I'm just going to start making myself without emotion, start to just enumerate the things that you have done for me that I take for granted. Now, God's Spirit is in us to help us with this, but I, I just want you to know it's going to take effort. You've got to push against your natural human tendency, which is take it all for granted and complain, you know? Now, here, here are some simple ways uh, to go about this that really do work. I mean, these are proven. Keep a journal where you you daily write down what you have to be thankful for. Write a, a letter, you know, to thank the people who have blessed your life, you know, like the grade school teacher encouraged you or someone who shared Jesus with you or prayed for you or refused to give up on you. You know, our lives are full of people to be thankful. I emailed a cousin the other night and, uh, you know, just to tell him he was, he's like a brother to me and, you know, I haven't talked to him in years. And it's just like, you know, I love you and... Uh, and then, you know, he texted me back at 6 o'clock the next morning. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Woke me up. <laughs> but, I, but it just began a whole dialogue between us. It's like, oh, yeah, man, I want you in my life. And, you know, another way to, to do this is to, uh, you know, write an email. Like I said, you know, you might want to call them and read the email to them. A, a group of students did this. They were given this assignment to text a, a you know, Write, write this all down and then call the adult, the parent, uh, uncle, you know, uh, grandpa, whoever. And uh, I want you to watch what happens uh, here. Let's watch the video. All right, get out your Kleenex, right? That was the fifth or sixth time or whatever I've seen it, and it hits me every time. I mean, you're thinking about somebody you need email, you need to write, yeah. I mean, and the rest of you aren't telling the truth. Come on, yeah. I mean, here's the deal. This is in our wiring. This is who we are. We were made to be grateful. It's a mindset that invigorates our lives, whether it's thanking God or thanking Grandpa. I mean, we, we were made for this. Jesus says in John 424, that God is actively looking for people who will worship him for who he is and thank him for what he does. I mean, it's staggering that my weak words could carry that kind of weight with my creator. But there it is. They matter. It's the one gift I give God that he can't give himself. My worship. One of my favorite stories about this in scripture is the exodus of God's people from their slavery in Egypt. And you remember the story, he performed some of the greatest miracles in history to deliver these people. And, and he doesn't just cut them loose. He personally leads all two plus million of them along with their sheep and goat and goats and donkeys and cattle and, you know, the whole menagerie. And they leave the only home they've known for 400 years. That's longer than we've been a nation. And they head for this unknown country led by an 80-year-old guy dressed in sheepskin carrying a shepherd's staff. But they're really being led by a miracle cloud that is swirling over their heads. Exodus 13, 21 says, By day, 
the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Now, I, I read that and I think, if I had something that supernatural that I could see with my eyes, I would be one grateful, trusting individual. I mean, come on. But actually, it's better than that. They, they didn't get sick. Their clothes didn't wear out. They're being fed this stuff called manna that appears on the ground every morning. And it must have been organic because, I mean, it was doing them good. I mean, they were, they were all healthy and they were able to travel. They're living with all this supernatural grace on them and, and, and this cloud right in front of their eyes. But were they grateful? You be the judge. Now, remember the story. Remember how it goes. They... They finally arrive at the entrance of the land. The cloud leads them right to this place. They send in a dozen men to check it out. Forty days later, they return to tell everybody what they saw. Here's the majority report. Ten of the twelve, ten of the guys say, God was absolutely right. It is awesome. This place is amazing. I mean, it literally flows with milk and honey. The, The land is so fertile beyond anything we've ever seen. Look at the fruit. And they, you know, got fruit, these monster pieces of fruit. Now, the people who live there, though, different story. They look like Hercules. I mean, this, the, these cities are like Fort Knox. There is no way we can just go in and take this place away from uh, these people. Now, you have to get the picture because we, we look at it. You know, they're saying, we're just a bunch of grasshoppers. You think, think of that, but think about what's happening. The cloud's still there. I mean, the cloud is still there. They're standing under a miracle cloud of God's manifest presence having a panic attack. I mean, fear has overwhelmed them. How is that possible? I think Numbers uh, chapter 14, verse 2 is the clue. It says, all the Israelites were grateful and thank God for giving them such a beautiful new home. No, they, they grumble and said, we would have been better off to just go back to Egypt. These are the same guys who watched God part the Red Sea and drown the entire Egyptian army. We, these are the same people that had watched all these incredible plagues over their enemies, had, had watched God do these kinds of things. I'll tell you what this says to me. If we are not intentionally reflecting on the faithfulness of God in our lives. Present, past, and future, because we got a bright future according to Scripture. If we're not intentionally doing this, if we're not thinking about that and meditating on the goodness of God, all of this negative stuff that is going on around us is going to ignite so much fear that it's going to suffocate our faith and drown all the joy right out of our lives like it did there. It's going to cause us to miss the mercies that could be ours because grumbling always turns us away from God. Gratitude turns us toward him. Look at this verse in Jonah 2.8. This has kind of been a life verse for me. It says, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit. They miss out on the grace that could be there. I think, you know, those other nine lepers missed out on the grace the tenth leper got. And I, I really believe this. I believe God is wanting to do all kinds of good stuff in our lives. But if we don't stay grateful, we won't position ourselves to receive it. Gratitude makes me blessable. In fact, that, 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 is, that is a phrase that you ought to try to lock into. Gratitude keeps me blessable. Gratitude keeps me blessable. Say that with me. Gratitude keeps me blessable. Look at it again. Those who worship idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. When we get our eyes on stuff, we stop being grateful for what God's given us, for what he's done, for what he continues to do in our lives. God's not opposed to us having possessions as long as our possessions don't possess us. So it's, it's all about our attitude toward those things that we have. As long as our hands stay open and our hearts stay right, we won't miss the gifts that he's wanting to give us in the moment. Job 121 says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never liked that verse. You know, because it, it, 
yeah, it's easy when the Lord gives, but how to, how to handle the Lord takes away? I go back to that verse. God is working all things together for my good. I don't get it. There are things that I'm not going to get. I don't always get what I want. I don't always understand what's happening to me now. I don't understand what God is doing. But I know this. He's working all things together for my good. Therefore, I can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and takes away, but I know his, he's good. I know he's good all the time. I know he's good every time. I know he's working for my good. I'm going to be a grateful worshiper in spite of what I'm going through. I'm going to worship you, God, in spite of what I'm feeling right now. I remember driving down 270 after we lost uh, our first baby in the fifth month of Debbie's pregnancy. I'm poor, crying my eyes out. And I, I don't even think I fully understood this back then. But I said, God, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. Something was happening in my heart. I couldn't see at the time. I, I'm telling you, there was a total rewiring that was happening inside me. I'm telling you, if we will work this muscle, we will be a people God can use in these coming years. People who won't be blown around by every late breaking news bulletin. People who will just be in this and go, I, don't, I know we're not... Things are tough right now. I know things aren't working, but blessed be the name of the Lord. He is a good God. He is working things together for my good, even though I can't see any of it right now. I'm telling you guys, the benefits of gratitude are endless. Being thankful frees us from anxiety, keeps us wading deeper into that river of life that flows from the throne of God. Thanksgiving helps us remember who he is because for some reason we are chronically forgetful. But the scriptures help us. In, in, in Psalm 37, 3, David said, trust in the Lord. Feed on his faithfulness. And how do you do that? Well, simple answer is by reflecting on what he says about himself, what he tells us in the pages of scripture, and on what he's done for us in the past. Again, it's what we read there in Psalm 23, 6. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, if you notice this, I can only see that in the rear view, mu uh, rear view mirror. I mean, I don't really, in the present, it's like, this doesn't look like you're working all things together for my good. But I look back a few years, and it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, I, if I hadn't gone through that, man, I was so full of myself. I get it, Lord. I see it. Surely, goodness and mercy, they're following me. Look back. Look back. 2020 perspective comes from looking back at the faithfulness of God. All right, try a little experiment here. All right, for the next just a few seconds, look around the room and try to find something with blue in it. All right? Just that ought to be easy. I'm seeing blue everywhere. Right, how many found it? Three things at least. Okay. All right, all right now. Stop for a minute. All right, look around again. Blue things starting to pop out at you? You know why that is? Because you put on a blue mindset. You thought about blue, and suddenly there's a lot of blue in this room. Wow, there's a bunch of blue. Even the floors are blue, for crying out loud. Now, you know, that's the same thing that happens when you buy a new car. It's like, I never realized so many people drove Ford Focuses. <laughs> wow, it's like everybody has one. You know, what is that? It's a matter of setting your mental channel. You know, you find what you're looking for. And if you look for the greatness and the goodness and the faithfulness of God, you know what? It's everywhere. It's like, oh, my goodness, Lord, you did that, and you did this, and you, you, did, you are working all things together for my good. And when you don't, you can be standing under a miracle cloud and miss the whole thing. Isn't that the truth? So this week, every time you think about the greatness of God or you remember something good he's done for you, try to express it with words. Now, this has been the big thing for me because I do this in my head sometimes. The Lord says, take, you know, the Bible says this in Hosea 12, 14 too. It says, take words with you and return to the Lord. God loves the sound of your voice. And if you can manage, you know, to get the notebook and start making a list so you've got something to say to him, that is even better. Remember what happened to the people who 
kept a gratitude journal. After three weeks, this guy said they were sleeping better, had more energy, and better abs. <laughs> Sorry. Just had to throw that in. We got, we, we got a place there in the bulletin where you can get started. I mean, just, just try it. See what happens. Because we got a week coming when, you know, going to be a lot of hectic craziness and getting Thanksgiving meals ready and all that kind of stuff. But, but let's, let's keep Thanksgiving the main focus this week. I mean, let's just, let's try it this week. When you go in the grocery store, just say, thank you, God, for all this abundance. You know, even though I'm hurting financially, I can still buy food. Thank you that, you know, we can vote and that there's a peaceful transition of leadership. That doesn't happen most places in the world. I mean, you have to have a coup to change leadership. Uh, thank you for our rights to speak free speech and religion, even though, you know, there are people that are pushing the limits on it right now. You know, thank you, God. Last week uh, on our San Francisco trip, you know, I just get, I have anxiety issues. It's no news to anybody here. And uh, a trip is just leaving the house and getting everything right and then getting on a plane and, you know, all the things that can go wrong. And we had a bunch of different places to be and I'm just, ah. So before we started, I just, uh, on my face before God, Lord, I am going to do my best. I'm going to help me or help me in my weakness, but I'm going to do my best to be grateful for everything that happens, including flight delays, lines. I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm just going to trust you in this whole deal, and I'm, you know, going to try to live in the moment, be grateful, and believe that you're working out the details even when I can't see it. And, and, you know, don't ask Debbie because I'm terrible at it. But, but the difference even that little bit of effort made was amazing. I mean, it, we had so many serendipitous moments where things just would come together and we'd end up the right place, the right time, and talking to the right person to say, oh, you want to go down the street and go to here? No, don't listen to anybody else. And it was just unbelievable. I mean, it was just, it was so many, there was, it, the, the, you know, evidence began to build. This could not have happened. I mean, it just was unreal. It really changes the picture when you invite God into it. Now, I say that because I've come home from vacations and needed another one to recuperate, you know, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we're, we're in a bad place. We're in a bad patch right now in America. I mean, there's a lot of vitriol and anxiety and frustration. And I mean, uh, it was just a lot of people where we were that were just full of anxiety. And, and I know maybe some of you are right now. Uh, the, the thing that's going to get us through this, the thing that's going to change the way we experience the holidays and, and, and moving forward is to engage in gratitude, to engage in saying, God, I am going to look at your hand. I'm going I'm to keep my focus on you. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord because he's working all things together for my good. I'm going to keep my eyes on you because I want us to enter this new year relaxed and happy and appreciating God and others and life more. And then we're going to come together Wednesday night and get the joy started. And uh, I really hope none of you miss that. I really recommend don't talk to your relatives about politics this Thursday <laughs> unless you just like anxiety. I mean, I don't know. You know, the, even the way we talk about it isn't right. I mean, even, even when we're agreeing, it's just uh, there's too much. I want to talk to you about that next weekend. I, I, want, I want to just kind of zero in on this, because I, I think there's some things we can do to pull out of this, to get our hearts on the right page, and to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. So just decide right now, I'm not going there. I'm not getting in all this stuff. When you, right, right in the middle, because right in the middle of some of these conversations, the Holy Spirit is going, whoa, buddy, whoa, 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 stop it. And Because you know what I'm talking about. You know the Holy Spirit is in you, and you know when he's trying to rein you in. And if you'll respond to that and say, you know what, let's just, let's just drop it. 